What's a grid? Think of a grid like a big checkerboard. It's a bunch of squares lined up in rows and columns. Just like a checkerboard, each square or tile can hold something. In this video, we're diving into how these grids can help you organize your game's world. The basics of a grid is super simple. It's just like the times table you learned in school, with numbers across the top and the left side. But instead of numbers, we fill each little square with stuff. For example, the screen you're watching this on uses tiny squares to show colors. Each square has a mix of red, green, and blue. That's the RGB. And by changing these, we can make any color you see on the screen. Games love this trick too, using grids to keep track of where everything goes on the ground. Each square in a grid has its own special address, kind of like a house number, but we use row and column, or just call for short. You can write them down in any order, but I like to start with the row first. So if we're looking for a square, we say it's at row zero, col seven, or maybe row five, col three. Now, how do we keep all these squares in order? We've got two main ways. First, we can line them up in a 2D array, which is a fancy way of saying a grid within a grid. To find a square, we just tell our array the row and column numbers, like, hey, give me what's in row two, call nine. Another way to organize our grids is by using a one-dimensional array. Imagine having a long line of boxes, and each box can hold a piece of our game's world. That's our one-dimensional array. To set it up, multiply the number of rows by the number of columns. And that's how big our line of boxes needs to be. Each box, or tile, gets a number called an ID. To find any tile, we use a simple trick. Take the tile's row number, multiply it by the total number of columns, and add the column number. For example, if we're looking for tile 86, we take row 8, multiply by total number of columns, which is 10, and add the tile's column number. When we want to check on every tile, we use loops. Think of it as going down each row and checking every column one by one. This way, we can peek into every box and see what's inside or pick out just the ones we need. Remember, you can start counting from any number, not just zero. And you can make your rows and columns range as big or small as you need. The math still works the same. Now let's put this into action. We'll use Unreal Engine's Blueprint system, which is like a visual way to program, perfect for those new to coding. It's all about connecting the nodes to the program and making our grid come to life. Start by launching the Epic Games Launcher. This tutorial works on all engine versions. Go to the Games section and choose the blank template. Make sure the blueprint is selected. Whether you're on a desktop or mobile, the steps are just the same. For desktop, go for maximum quality to make it look super sharp. Skip the starter content and ray tracing options to keep things light and simple. Name your project and hit the Create button. I don't want to see this landscape every time I open the project, so let's change the default map. From the project settings, go to Maps and Modes and clear the Editor Startup Map and Game Default Map. Now let's build our default map. I want to keep everything simple, so I will choose the basic map and save this new map inside your project content folder. Same as the project name, I will call this map grids and back to the project settings and set the default maps to our new map. For the next step, we can create the Generator Blueprint class to handle the grid creation process. I will create a Blueprints folder to keep files organized and to create the class right-click on the content browser and choose Blueprints class. And we need the first class, which is Actor, and I will call it BP underscore Generator. We need another blueprint class as our tile. The steps are the same again. Create a new actor class, and this time I will call it BP underscore tile. I will use the BP as a standard prefix to keep things organized, but you don't have to. The first thing we learned in the first part of the video was each tile needs an address. So we need two variables to store the row and the column address that this tile belongs to. And variable types must be integer. 
to give this tile a representation in the level. I will give it a static mesh component, and I will set that to be as the root component. From the static mesh menu, search for the plane and select that as the default mesh. And to override its material, add an override material. And from the materials menu, select the background material or any other material you like. In older versions of Unreal Engine, you don't need to add the material override manually. Now, our base tile is ready and we can go to the generator class. Same as before, we need a representation for this class in level to be able to quickly find and select it. This time, I just need an icon. To give an icon to your class, you can give it the billboard component. And same as before, I will set it as root. Now, you can easily change its icon from the sprite menu. I will leave it as it is. This generator is like the base table we had, and we need to add some variables to it to make it functional. First of all, we need to tell the size of our grid to the generator, so let's create two more variables. The first variable is rows, and the second variable is columns. And both of them must be integer. Also, we can click on the eye icon to make them visible from the level, so we can directly edit them on each instance of the generator in the level. Next, we need a place to store tiles in this grid. I will create a new variable, and I will set its name to tiles. The type of this variable must be the same class as the tile we made earlier, so search for the BP underscore tile, and make sure you choose object reference as its type, because we are going to store references to the tiles. Currently, this variable is referencing to only one tile, but we need to store an array of tiles. So it can store references to all tiles. Click on this arrow and select the array. As you can see, its icon changed and it shows multiple squares instead of one square and everything looks good so far. Now we are ready to initialize our tiles. So create a new function to initialize tiles. But before that, we need to make sure previously initialized tiles are destroyed. So let's create a new function and call it clear tiles. Before starting the function, first, I will check if there is any tiles to destroy by checking the length or size of our array of tiles. If yes, I will iterate over the array and destroy all tiles. This loop will call destroy actor function on all tiles. Once loop completed, I have to empty the actual array of tiles because we don't want to store a reference to the tiles that don't exist anymore. So I will call clear function on the tiles array when loop completed. Back to the initialize function. In this function, first we need to call the clear tiles function. In the next step, we need two loops to spawn or create our tiles. The first loop iterates over the rows and the second loop iterates over columns, but we need to subtract one from each of them because they are the actual size of the grid, not the actual last row or column index. Let's back to the chart. As you can see, the index of the first row is zero and also the index of the first column is zero too. And the last column index is nine, but we have 10 columns, same for the rows. So the last index for rows is always one less than the row counts. The same for the columns, we need to subtract one from the columns count. To spawn or create the actual tiles, we need to use the spawn actor from class function. Choose the class as BP underscore tile. And for the spawn transform, we can make a custom transform. We can use generator location and rotation as spawn location and rotation and leave the scale as it is. So to get the location right, click on the empty space and search for the get actor location node. This node will return the current generator location in the level. Do the same for the rotation and search for get actor rotation node. Change the collision handling to always spawn. Leave the instigator empty. Click on the arrow icon to set the owner. We want the owner of each spawned tile be this generator. 
So drag a connection from that and search for get a reference to self node. It will set the instance of this generator class as the tile owner. Now it's time to set the tile address. Drag a connection from the return node, search for the set row, and connect the current index from the first loop, which is the row. And do the same to set column. Now connect it to the second loop index, which is the column. Now we can test our generator to be able to call this function directly from the editor and enable call in editor. Drag and drop the generator blueprint class into the level and set the rows and columns to some values and hit the initialize tiles button. As you can see, tiles are created, but they are not in the correct location. Also, if you check them in the outliner window, they are not attached to the generator. So if I move the generator, tiles won't move. To keep things clear in the initialize function, let's move these new functionalities to the actual tile class. I will create a new initialize function in the tile class to handle tile setup as a security check. First of all, let's check if the owner we set in the generator class is valid. If so, we can attach this tile to the owner by using the attach actor to actor node. The target node is the instance of this tile class, so we can leave it as self. Parent actor is the generator class. So we want to attach this tile to the generator, which stored as the owner. We don't need to use any socket. And location rule and rotation rule must be snap to target. And we can leave the scale rule to keep its relative, and we don't need to weld them together, as these two don't simulate any physics behavior. Now, let's fix the tile location. First, we need to know the actual size of the static mesh to find that we can use the get component bounds node. And if you open the actual mesh and make the pivot point visible, you will see that pivot is at the center, so the box extent node will give you exact half of the mesh size, and in this case 50 by 50. Now that we have the size in both the X and Y axis, we can easily multiply them by the address to get the exact location of the tile in the grid. And for the last step, we need to set this coordinate as the relative location of the tile to its parent, which is the generator. And don't forget to call this initialize function from the generator class. And last but not least, we need to store the spawned tile in the tiles array. Let's clean this section by setting the address directly at the spawn node, back to the tile class, and make sure instance editable and expose on spawn are enabled for both row and column. Now, if we refresh the spawn node, you will see them. This setup is much cleaner. Let's back to level and test generator again. As you can see, our grid is ready. Now, you can click on each tile and change its static mesh to any other mesh you like. If you are looking for an advanced level generator that can also handle the mesh placing for you based on your rules, you can check my procedural level generator. All you need to do is set up the sockets, think of them as plugs, and the rules for each piece. Once that's done, the level generator takes over, crafting endless levels for your game. It's like having a magic wand for level design. It works with both 2D and 3D levels. So your imagination is the limit if you want to build levels while your game is running, or if you want to make your game multiplayer. This level generator is ready for action anytime, anywhere. Curious about all the cool things this generator can do? There's a whole playlist of videos waiting for you. Dive in and see how it can transform the way you create. Please find the links in the description.
Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to channel for more videos.